Harper Audio presents A Clash of Kings by George R. R. Martin. Read by Roy Detrice. Prologue The comet's tail spread across the dawn, a red slash that bled above the crags of Dragonstone like a wound in the pink and purple sky. The maester stood on the windswept balcony outside his chambers. It was here the ravens came after long flight. Their dropping speckled the gargoyles that rose twelve feet tall on either side of him, a hellhound and a wyvern, two of the thousand that brooded over the walls of the ancient fortress. When first he came to Dragonstone, the army of stone grotesques had made him uneasy, but as the years passed he'd grown used to them. Now he thought of them as old friends. The three of them watched the sky together with foreboding. The maester did not believe in omens, and yet, old as he was, Cresson had never seen a comet half so bright, nor yet that colour, that terrible colour, the colour of blood and flame and sunsets. He wondered if his gargoyles had ever seen its like. They had been here so much longer than he had, and would still be here long after he was gone. If stone tongues could speak. Such folly! He leaned against the battlement, the sea crashing beneath him, the black stone rough beneath his fingers. Talking gargoyles and prophecies in the sky? I am an old dun man, grown giddy as a child again. Had a lifetime's hard-worn wisdom fled him along with his health and strength? He was a maester, trained and chained in the great citadel of Old Town. What had he come to, when superstition filled his head as if he were an ignorant field hand? And yet, and yet, the comet burned even by day now, while pale grey steam rose from the hot vents of Dragonmont behind the castle. And yester morn, a white raven had brought word from the citadel itself, a word long expected, but no less fearful for all that, word of summer's end, omens all, too many to deny. What does it all mean? he wanted to cry. Mr. Cress, we have visitors, Pilar spoke softly, as if loath to disturb Cresson's solemn meditations. Had he known what dribble filled his head, he would have shouted. The princess would see the white raven. Ever correct, Pilus called her princess now, as her lord father was a king. King of a smoking rock in a great salt sea, yet a king nonetheless. Her fool is with her. The old man turned away from the dawn, keeping hand on his wyvern to steady himself. Help me to my chair and show them in. Taking his arm, Pilus led him inside. In his youth, Cresson had walked briskly, but he was not far from his eightieth name day now, and his legs were frail and unsteady. Two years passed, he had fallen and shattered a hip, and it had never mended properly. Last year, when he took ill, the Citadel had sent Pilus out from Old Town, mere days before Lord Stannis had closed the aisle. To help him in his labours, it was said, but Cresson knew the truth. Pilus had come to replace him when he died. He did not mind. Someone must take his place, and sooner than he would like. He let the younger man settle himself behind his books and papers. Go bring her. It is ill to keep a lady waiting. He waved a hand, a feeble gesture of haste from a man no longer capable of hastening. His flesh was wrinkled and spotted, his skin so papery thin that he could see the web of veins and the shape of bones beneath. And how they trembled, these hands of his that had once been so sure and deft. When Pilus returned, the girl came with him, shy as ever. Behind her, shuffling and hopping in that queer sideways walk of his, came her fool. On his head, was a mock helm fashioned from an old tin bucket with a rack of deer antlers strapped to the crown and hung with cowbells. With his every lurching 
Sample complete. Ready to continue?